I'm really pleased to introduce this afternoon Liz Wilde, who's a really experienced life coach and, um, and thinker about adoption. And uh, she's going to thankfully share our thoughts, her thoughts with us. So over to you, Liz. Thank you. Hi, thanks, Mike. Um, hello, everyone. What fantastic presentations we've seen and heard uh, today so far. Absolutely wonderful, wonderful for me to be part of this community. So thanks, Mike, for inviting me. I'm a newbie. So today I'm going to show you how my, I created my identity through the stories I told myself growing up as an adoptee, how it was my interpretation of events, far more than the actual events themselves, which shaped who I thought I needed to be to stay safe in this world. We all do this. The world is literally what we think it is. We, were, we are all creating our experience of life with our thinking moment to moment. I also want to show you how it's never too late to change the story. I have some questions at the end of my talk that will hopefully inspire you to challenge your own interpretations, have a, another look at your own stories. So please have a pen and paper handy or your phone. Uh, and Mike is also gonna put them in the chat. So let's go back to 1969. I'm showing my age, aren't I? I was six years old when I was first told that I was adopted. So I can remember the scene so, so well, sitting in my pink flowery bedroom on my mum's knee on the wicker chair when she told me that my real mum had been unable to keep me. Now, I would never use the term real mum now, but I'm sure that that was the term that my mum used way back then. So how terrified was I in that moment? Absolutely terrified. Everything that I'd taken for granted had suddenly disappeared. I, I can put myself back now to that very moment. My interpretation of what my mum said, the story I told myself was, if my mother had been able to give me away, how much easier would it be for these strangers? It would only be a matter of time before these new parents of mine would do the same. You know, when our minds are insecure, we always go to the negative, don't we? We always go to the painful. So not surprisingly, I've developed quite a healthy fear of abandonment. I remember when I went to, this is obviously when I was there young, I'd go to infant school. My mum would drop me off at the door and I would make her promise she'd be standing in the exact same spot when I came out. She couldn't even be further down the hall. She had to be in the exact same spot. And if I ran out the door and she wasn't there just for a moment, my heart would just turn over. I also remember uh, being in floods of tears when my mum and dad left me at brownie camp, taking it as a, an absolute sense of abandonment. When they came back to pick me up, I actually don't think I talked for them, to them for about two days. I also remember sobbing when I was left at a Sunday school, just them walking out the door and leaving me somewhere else was just the end of the world. So that was the story that I had. But what I didn't see, of course, was that my adopted parents really wanted children. They wanted me very, very much. So why on earth would they have given me back, had given me away, whatever I thought, would walk out the door and never come back? Why on earth would they do that? So moving on to growing up. Adoption was never mentioned at home. You know, it's, it's the big secret, wasn't it? The big secret to be kept at all costs. I have another very strong memory of walking along the road with my father and a friend of the family said, obviously not that close a friend, but a, a, a friend of the family said to my dad, oh, hasn't she got beautiful eyes? And my dad said, quick as a flash, yes, she takes after my wife. And I looked at my dad, I was totally confused because, of course, I'd been brought up to be told not to lie, to never tell a lie. 
And I thought, but well, that's not true, Dad. But it was not even mentioned. We just carried on walking down the road as though nothing had happened. I was also terrified of exposure. So my colouring was a lot darker than my parents. Actually, my adoptive mum had red hair and glasses, so she couldn't have been more different from me. My dad had brown hair. And I remember at school, people would say, you've got black hair. And I'd say, no, 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 it's brown. Because I felt that my cover would be blown if people could see that my colouring was different to my parents, that I didn't look like my parents. Now, I didn't know anyone else who was adopted, anyone. And I felt very different from all my friends. And the story I came up with that, with for that was that I am the only child whose mother has given her away, given them away, the only child. It's happened to no one else. And because of that, I thought to myself, no one must ever know this shameful secret. Now, what I didn't see, well, I didn't see that my parents were protecting themselves by not telling anyone, by keeping this, this under wraps. They didn't want anyone to know that they had been unable to have children of their own. It had nothing to do with me. It was no failing on my part. And also what I didn't see was the comments about my coloring, coloring were compliments. I didn't see that either. So teenage angsty years, we all have those, don't we? I very much felt like an outsider like I didn't belong, as, as I've heard today already. It's common, obviously, very, very common. And also common, I've heard today, is I didn't feel like I could trust the bond with my adopted parents. So I pushed back to try and prove myself right. I had lots and lots of horrendous arguments with my father. He was very strong-willed, and I believe I was probably rather strong-willed myself. Uh, yeah, so a pretty horrendous time, actually, a lot of the time. I remember at the age of, it was 13, I'm sure, and after a particularly bad row with my father, I was walking to my friend's house, obviously in a very low mood, and I suddenly had the thought, and again, I can remember the, the road I was walking and I can remember exactly where I was. You know, these, these memories are just right in there, aren't they, forever? And I thought to myself, if my own mother didn't want me, I must be a terrible person. Now, that wasn't a very comfortable thought to have at the age of 13 and, and later, obviously. So what didn't I see? That was my story. That was my painful story. What didn't I see? And what I didn't see because I didn't know, had no idea, was the adoption practices of the 1950s, 60s, even 70s. The pressure on unmarried women to have their child adopted by a two-parent family. It was best for the child, considered best for the child. I had no idea of any of that, not a clue. So during this time, my scared young mind created a subconscious survival strategy. I wanted to feel safe and secure, so I came up with a master plan. And my master plan was this. No one was ever going to have power over my life again. Because the way I saw it, no one had asked me who I wanted to live with. This huge life-changing decision had been made without any uh, thought to ask me. So no one was ever going to have that power over my life again. So what did this look like? This looked like I had to be 100% independent, both emotionally, which meant I needed total freedom, no marriage and no children. And also financially, I was, uh, I was um, saving my birthday money into a little post office account from a very, very young age because I believed I had to be self-sufficient. No one was ever gonna make decisions for me again. I had created an identity who I thought I needed to be to stay safe. 
So moving on, I started searching as soon as I possibly could at the age of 18. Now, we all know practices were very different then. The social worker gave me very basic information, uh, essentially my original name and place of birth and my mother's, my natural mother's name and her place of birth, really hardly anything else. And these basics were just so I could start searching through the huge birth, deaths and marriage ledgers at St. Catherine's, Do St. Catherine's House sorry, in London, looking for any reference for my natural mother. I was told nothing about the story behind my adoption, certainly nothing about the sad circumstances behind why my mother had to give me away. And I think even today, how much earlier I could have rewritten my painful story, story if I'd known, if I'd known the facts back then when I was 18. But unfortunately, the story I still believed was that my mother had given me up willingly. And what I didn't know, because I wasn't allowed to know, was the truth. So let's pause for a moment to see what was going on in my mind during this time. I often say to clients, what the thinker thinks, the prover proves. I believed I'd been unwanted, that something was wrong with me and my brain looked for evidence every day to support that belief. It's confirmation bias, right? Our brains love to make us right. So every argument with my parents, what did I make it mean? You don't want me, you don't love me. Every disloyalty, every hurt with friends, family, boyfriends, teachers, a reason to believe my story more, a reason to dig in. I saw the world through the filter of my insecure thinking, and boy, did I construct some high protective walls, which weren't very easy to live behind either. So aged 40, I began a two-year training program to become a life coach. I'd been working in women's magazines for most of my adult life, and I was always someone that my friends came to for advice with their problems. I was fascinated by how our minds work, not, not just, not least of all mine, because I was bored of my self-protection, of pretending I didn't need anyone and people believing me. <laughs> hey, I thought, you know, there must be an easier way. So early on in my training, I read a book and the book asked me a question. Which of these words would you most hate people to think about you? And the options were stupid, weak, lazy, incompetent. And the word that literally jumped out of the page at me was rejected. I had never articulated that word before, and it had such a potent sting. The thought that anyone could think that of me was horrendous, was, was terrible. So part of my training to become a life coach is I had, I had coaching myself. And I approached my first, co first coaching session saying to my new coach, I think my problems stem from being rejected as a baby. And this coach was very wise and she was able to distance me from my pain, painful story for the first time. And she said to me, you were never rejected. The decision was made before you were even born. How could you be rejected, she said, if you didn't even exist? Well, that was nothing short of a revelation, I can assure you. Because for the first time, I thought, maybe it's not about me. And if it's not about me, do I have to be ashamed anymore? Is this such a shameful secret anymore? I felt stronger 
uh, around this time. So I pushed to see my adoption file. And for the first time, I saw the true story. Far from being rejected, my mother had fought to keep me. There were letters in my adoption file describing her torment at being parted from her. She actually put off signing the adoption papers for nine long months as she tried to find a way to keep me. There were also letters in the file from the adoption agency to my natural mother detailing my parents, my adopted parents' distress while they waited to hear from her. So here was a true story. I was wanted very much by both my natural mother and my adopted parents. You know, this was no longer a shameful secret. I didn't feel rejected anymore. And something else, maybe even this was something to be proud of, that these, all these people had wanted me. So I managed to wrestle uh, some letters and photos from my file from the social worker. It, was, it wasn't easy, but I managed to get some. And I made a collage and I put them on my wall to remind myself every day of how much I'd been loved. Years later, I tracked down my Spanish father's family, so hence the dark hair. My mother had met him while she was staying with her parents who owned a bar in Benidorm. He was separated from his wife, but was unable to get a divorce in 1960s Catholic Spain. They'd lived together, and when my mother fell pregnant, she came back to England to give birth to me to avoid a scandal. My father had expected her return to return to Spain with me. Instead, I learned for the first time that my grandmother, my natural mother's mother, had told him that I died soon after being born. They had believed that it was best that if he couldn't marry her, she could start again. My father died young in a car accident, so I was never able to meet him. But my cousin's husband, who had been good friends with him, told, told me, if he'd known you had survived, oh, this always gets me, he would have traveled the world to find you. Hmm. Actually, let me just take a sip of this. So, this was a part of the true story that I hadn't even considered, that my, my natural father had wanted me. That just really didn't fit with the story I'd been telling myself, that he was the, the bad deserter in this. So the first step for changing the script in my head was I began to dismantle all the insecure stories I'd believed over the years and instead focused on the reality I now knew. I did this by writing on post-it notes. I was never rejected. I was wanted very much. And I stuck them all around the house. So I would be reading them constantly. This was to rewire my subconscious survival strategies because it felt very much now like Maybe I didn't have to protect myself so much. And as we all know, protecting ourselves can be such hard work. Soon after my adoptive mother died, we'd always been an undemonstrative family. And I was able to tell her for the first time as she lay unresponsive in bed. It was two days before she died. I was able to say to her, I was so glad you were my mother. Oh, that was that still gets me as well. And she opened her eyes and big smile on her face. She always had a big smile. And she just asked me why. And then her eyes closed and she went back to being in unresponsive. But I was able to tell her for the first time. And I'm so glad of that. After her death, my adoptive fam father opened up a little more about my adoption as well, as, as I said before, never, never mentioned. And he told me that after I'd been handed over to my mum and him in the adoption agency, 
they were in a room and my natural mother had fought to get her to get herself back into the room so that she could take me back and she'd had to be physically restrained from from grabbing me out of my mum's my new mother's arms so the full story full true story at last was that I had absolutely no doubt in my mind anymore that either my natural parents had wanted me sorry either my natural parents had given me up willing I, willingly I should have said or that my adopted parents had wanted me very much so step two to challenging my story. During my 20 years of plus, actually, of life coaching, I've remained fascinated with how our minds work and I'm always keen to learn more. Five years ago, I discovered what is often referred to as the inside out understanding, which has now totally changed how I see my own life and has also changed how I coach my clients. At its core is the principle that our experience of life is created by our thoughts moment to moment. We are literally creating our reality with our thinking, which is why one day a situation can, can seem impossible and the next day can feel completely different. The situation hasn't changed, but our thoughts about it have. We've been conditioned to believe that what we see out there is objective reality, when really we're all viewing the world through our own thought systems, all the data we've hoovered up over the years and now believe to be true. Like wearing a pair of 3D goggles, we live in a world of our own backstory. So our memories, our interpretations, our perceptions, our conditioning, we see what we expect to see. I put on my rejection goggles and that's what I saw. I put on my, I wasn't wanted goggles and I saw evidence every day that I was right. I now help clients to see through their own stories, to question the reality they've created, to question the labels they've given themselves and to question the childhood survival strategies that are always way out of date. I want to leave you with some questions today to start the process for yourself. So please write them down or refer back to the chat later. So the first question is, what's a painful story you created long ago that has looked more and more real to you as you collected evidence over the years to support it. Revisit this story. Is it still accurate? Is it still relevant? Is it even true? How would your life be different without this story? What else is possible? Might an alternative story give you a better life? My second question. I'm probably speaking a bit too quick, can't I? Can you identify one of the survival strategies your own mind came up with when you were young? Like my 100% independent story. A strategy that was designed to help you feel safe and avoid discomfort. I had a client last week 
who was moving into management and felt scared that people wouldn't like her if she had to make difficult decisions, if she had to stop being everyone's friend. She went to a ferocious girls boarding school from a very young age. And basically you were either popular or your life was a living nightmare. She had no idea, but she had the belief in her head, I have to be liked or something terrible will happen. This was totally subconscious. And when we discovered this on our session, she cried. She had no idea that she'd been holding this back and holding on to the memories that, you know, as a young child was so terrifying for her. But once she saw where this came from, she could also see that it was no longer relevant to the present day. She was an adult now. She wasn't a child away from her family in a very scary place. And she was able to drop the fear and feel much better about moving into her managerial position. So my second part of my second question is, how does this strategy, excuse me, how does this strategy still play out in your life today? And importantly, what is it costing you? There's a wonderful quote by Janet Malcolm, an American author. We go through life mishearing and misseeing and misunderstanding. So the stories we tell ourselves will add up. We all have our own way of punching ourselves in the head, of hurting ourselves with our own fear-based thinking. We've learned to interpret this thinking as if it was reality, but we forget we're the ones who are actually doing the thinking. It's like a child drawing a picture of a monster and then running out of the door screaming. We're all weebling along in our own separate realities, innocently mistaking our thoughts for the truth. We then live in the feeling of our thinking and cause ourselves so much unnecessary pain and suffering. It's not that tragedies don't happen, but it's what we make of them that create our experience of life. Most importantly, what we make them mean about ourselves. I hope I've got you curious about your own stories today and how they might not be true, especially if they were created from an insecure state of mind. When my clients see through their own stories and strategies, their lives get so much easier. So please do spend some time reflecting on my questions. One more thing I'd love to leave you with. I'd love you to start noticing how your thoughts are creating your experience of life moment to moment. It really is a game changer. It has certainly changed my life completely. And I see it every day with my clients. Because once you see this, you can also see that all it takes is a new thought to create a different experience, to create a far kinder story, to give you a fresh start. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And thanks, Mike, for inviting me.